In one of our first lectures, we spoke about lattice vibrations. Then we moved our attention to describing the material properties from the very basic level using the electrons. Today, before we move on to continuing our quest on describing material properties and the electronic structure and employing more and more sophisticated quantum mechanical based approaches, we make a small detour bringing us back to the lattice vibrations. Why, why to do so? Uh, in the previous two models that we described the electronic system, namely in the Drude model of solids and in the Sommerfeld model of solids, we determined the heat capacity. We determined in Drude model a value which was temperature independent, in the Sommerfeld model, we derived a value which was linearly increasing with temperature. These values of heat capacity do not, however, describe the total heat capacity, but they describe the amount of heat energy we have to input in the system of electrons when we want to increase its temperature by one degree. However, the electrons are not the only thing which can and should be excited in materials when we increase temperature. There are other quasi-particles which need to obtain energy as well, which need to be excited, which need to become in thermodynamic equilibrium at a given temperature. And one very important contribution are the phonons or the lattice vibrations. Let's have a look at this topic. Uh, a short motivation why to look at the uh, phenomena which are related to the temperature. Probably this very atomistic or electronic structure thoughts might be to many of you relatively exotic. We're speaking about thermodynamic equilibrium at microstructural level at the level of describing of different phase equilibria, phase coexistence, phase transformations might be much more familiar to you. Majority of you went through the metallurgy courses. You learned how to read and how to construct the phase diagrams, iron carbon phase diagram, nickel titanium phase diagram or any other even more complicated phase diagrams. Eventually, all those are based on estimating the minimum Gibbs free energy for a given composition, given com a given temperature, and figuring out which constitution of our alloy would yield this minimum energy configuration. The minimum energy is actually minimum of a thermodynamic potential, a well-known Gibbs-free energy, and has several contributions. Apart from the inner energy and apart from the uh, energies which are related to pressure, to applied external uh, stress field, we have also uh, contributions which are related to entropy, to increased disorder of the system. What can be causing this disorder? There are several different uh, origins of the disorder. It might be the electronic excitations. So not all electrons sit in their ground state configuration, which we know what it is. It might be the lattice vibrations. So the atoms do not sit on their ideal lattice positions, but they actually vibrate. They have only some mean positions and a certain distribution of positions. There might be also magnetic excitations, which are responsible for magnetic ordering and magnetic phase transformations. We might have contributions coming from actually the uh, configuration of our alloy, configurational entropy and uh, related contribution, which actually uh, stabilizes the solid solutions at high temperatures. And all of those are contributions to the entropy. 
and the entropy then becomes the one of the most important temperature dependent contributions of the Gibbs free energy. Now, why are we interested in those temperature dependent um, thermodynamic potentials? Well, that's because it is connected with many interesting or engineering um, relevant topics. Thermal expansion, uh, one example here, I guess none of us wants to go on railway, which goes on rails like these. These are rails which are damaged by an extensive heat. Uh, probably when you go actually from university here towards the train station and you cross the bridge uh, in front of the main train station building, you would notice such a uh, saw like connections on the bridge, which are there exactly again to account for the thermal expansion of the bridge construction and so that the bridge even under the summer heat doesn't get bulged up, but instead of that it expands and just closes the gaps between the individual teeth. Another phenomena might be shape memory effects, a well-known phase transformation um, which is induced by the change of the temperature, but which also results in the change of shape, can recover the shape. And one of such uh, applications of shape memory effect uh, are, for example, the wings on satellites when, when the satellite goes away from the direct sunlight, temperature drops down, phase transformation happens, and because of the phase uh, of the shape change, uh, the solar panels would clap to protect the solar cells. When the satellite comes again into the sunlight, temperature rises, the wings open, and again uh, the satellite starts charging from the solar light. Another type of applications include, for example, pyroelectricity, so the temperature induced uh, char uh, charges or currents. And um, again, such uh, motion sensors is something that we are all uh, used to. Nowadays, you enter the toilet and the light goes on you come home and the light in front of your house goes on. All of those are actually based on pyroelectric effect. Again, an effect in which temperature plays a crucial role. Conductivity of metals, the fact that the conductivity of metal decreases, the fact that the conductivity of semiconductor increases with temperature, all those are temperature related. Uh, phenomena and to a certain degree related also to the excitations in the material. And of course, there would be many others as well. So this, this is somehow the motivation why we would like to study the impact of temperature on our material behavior. And I have already mentioned the contributions to the Gibbs free energy are numerous. And the one that we explicitly want to treat today are the lattice vibrations. And we would like to establish what is the heat capacity related to the lattice vibrations. In other words, we already know from our previous treatments from the Trude and Sommerfeld models, how much energy do we need to put into the system of electrons to increase its temperature by one degree. Now we would like to also learn how much energy do we need to put into the system to increase the energy, uh, to, to increase the temperature by one degree, also by keeping the atoms and their vibrations in thermodynamic equilibrium. Of course, we cannot have a um, separated temperature, the whole system should be in thermodynamic equilibrium. And therefore, both the atoms as well as their surrounding electronic cloud should be at the same temperature.
what we will be doing here is to describe the phonons, that is vibrations, as a set of harmonic oscillators. Each of such oscillator oscillates with a given frequency and the corresponding energy of such an harmonic oscillator is given by the reduced Planck's constant times this frequency. Frequencies and their distribution as a function of the K vector, so of the uh, wave vector of the lattice vibration of the phonon, as well as of the polarization. So in order, uh, in, in other words, the index of the uh, phonon branch. This is something that we have derived a couple of weeks ago in our uh, lattice vibrations lecture. So eventually, if you remember the phonon dispersion curve, then we had several branches, several branches would correspond to different indices P. And each of these branch was essentially a dependence of the lattice vibration frequency, omega, on a lattice, uh, on a wave vector. And this wave vector is the vector K that we have here. So we use those two indices, natural indices that we had in the uh, dispersion relationship as those that index the frequencies omega. We have a series of these oscillators and we ascribe to each of them a frequency h bar omega. Now those oscillations, the phonons, quasi-particles, they can be shown to be so-called bosons and that are quasi-particles which follow the Bose-Einstein statistics. That means that a mean number of phonons in a given state is given by such expression. The expression contains also a factor beta, so-called thermodynamic beta, and this is the factor which uh, introduces into this uh, whole formulation the temperature dependence. This formula can be derived from thermodynamics and it's basically beyond what we want to do here. But what I want to show you on the right hand side is the difference in the different distributions. While the red curve corresponds to fermions and with decreasing temperature would lead to the sharp shape of this form. The gray and especially the green lines, they correspond to the Maxwell-Boltzmann, the gray line, and to the Bose-Einstein line, the green one. At zero Kelvin, both of these essentially degenerate into a delta function in which we have a peak at just the uh, chemical potential value. So eventually all our phonons, they degenerate into a single state, a configuration which is forbidden for fermions because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And we have phonons, which are bosons, so integer spin particles. And as such, they do not, uh, uh, they, they do not follow or they do not have to fulfill the Pauli exclusion principle. That means that at zero Kelvin, they can all collapse into a single state, into the lowest energy state. Right? If you remember, it was last lecture when we spoke about the differences between the different um, statistics. And we said that uh, both bosons and fermions are in indistinguishable particles, but unlike fermions, the bosons can occupy, so each state can be occupied by any number of the bosons. So this is exactly what now the statistics uh, distribution of the states as energies would state from here. So similarly to what we did with the uh, total energy and the heat capacity evaluations for electrons, 
we now need to calculate the total energy for this set of lattice vibrations for this set of uh, oscillators, harmonic oscillators. Um, the heat capacity is defined as a volumetric density of the change of the total energy with temperature. So the critical thing for estimation of the heat capacity is really estimate the total energy. This is what we are trying to do here. So you would be tempted to write that the total energy is a sum over all oscillators, right? Which each of these oscillator we said has an energy corresponding to H bar, so the reduced Planck's constant and its frequency. And for each such oscillator, we know how many of those oscillators we have excited. That's given by the Bose Einstein statistics, by the distribution function. And so we multiply the energy of that given oscillator by the number of states that occupy, that are occupied. Maybe to a certain surprise, we have there also a prefactor here, so called uh, zero. Well, um, a prefactor which has a value h bar omega half. What is now this? Well, if you go with temperature to zero Kelvin, then this prefactor, this this exponential function here would uh, tend to go, so we have the beta, right, which is k v t, and if we go with t to zero, then h omega over k b t goes to infinity, and exponential function of infinity goes to, uh, Now I'm getting lost here. What am I missing? We should be getting that actually this second part is now going to zero. Uh, good. Um, I am right. The well, of course, the h omega bar goes to infinity and exponential function of x for x going to infinity goes to infinity. So this denominator here goes to infinity and the whole fraction here goes to, to zero as temperature approaches zero. Sorry for my blind moment. So as we go with temperature to zero, we'll be left just with this constant contribution here. One half h bar omega. And that means that unlike a set of classical particles which follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics, which at temperature equal to zero, exhibit the total energy equal to zero. The set of quantum mechanical oscillators would not actually exhibit the total energy equal to zero, but would exhibit a certain finite value of the total energy. This finite value is so-called zero energy, zero point energy, zero point or zero temperature energy. And we are probably wondering, where does this come from? And I do not want to introduce here the whole quantum mechanical treatment, which uh, sort of involves a complicated solution of the uh, real ground state and so on. For this, I would direct you to basic quantum mechanical uh, texts and textbooks. But I would like to show here, where does this come from? What is the origin that the energy of the oscillator at zero Kelvin is non-zero? That actually, when we start with quantizing the energies, we even start not at the absolute zero, but we start at um, a non-zero value. This comes to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. 
the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that we cannot estimate with the same accuracy both position and momentum of a quantum mechanical particle. There is a limit to which we can estimate them. The more precise you estimate position, the less precise is the momentum information and vice versa. And namely, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the delta x times delta p is larger than h bar half. The exact factors, whether it's h bar half or something, they, they might uh, differ. But let's stick with this definition uh, or with this expression for the time being. So to see again, how does this appear? This zero point energy. Let us now assume a harmonic oscillator with certain with a Hamiltonian that corresponds to this harmonic oscillator. That means it has kin kin the potential energy, which is simply given by a force constant, spring constant, and the displacement from its equilibrium position x zero and a corresponding kinetic energy. What we try to do now is that indeed we try to apply the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we have here. When we try to do that, we have to realize uh, how do we calculate this uh, delta, so the uh, mean deviation of the expectation value. The definition is indeed given here. So we calculate the square root of the difference between the expectation value of the quantity squared minus the mean value of the quantity. And this mean value is squared. Right? Realize the difference between what we have here and what we have here. This is. For example, a mean value, so maybe even better to show it here on the momentum. The momentum we say is mass times velocity. Right? So the mean value of the momentum is zero. When you look at the oscillator, it always uh, oscillates in positive and negative directions and the mean value over all possible configurations is zero because it is harmonic and it goes with the same velocities on both directions. However, this is not true for velocity squared, right? which is not with the sign, but it is always uh, essentially the kinetic energy, independent whether it goes left or right has the same kinetic energy as long as the length of the vector of the velocity is the same. Because it depends only on the velocity squared, only on the modulus of the velocity vector. So while the momentum, uh, the mean value of momentum is uh, equal to zero, and therefore the mean value of momentum squared is equal to zero since the kinetic energy mean kinetic energy is non-zero therefore also the mean value of momentum squared now the quantity is momentum squared and we calculate the mean value is non-zero right so in this particular expression the second part is going to be zero, and this first part is non zero. When we look at the first term that we have here, the mean value of the position is x zero because we oscillate around x zero. This is exactly what this expression says. But of course, this is not true for x uh, squared. This is not x0 squared, and we have then to derive what this value is. Uh, if we try to do this, we then 
can simplify this first term or it will lead us to the expression that we have here. Uh, actually, we have unfortunately this head should be here above the x quantity, right? Uh, that means that we have now derived that the x minus x0, the whole thing squared, and the mean value, the expectation value of this uh, of this variable, uh, times the expectation uh, the, the expectation value of the momentum squared, and the square root of those two values is larger than reduced one constant half. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And you might already see in here that this term that we have here is very similar to what we have in here. This part resembles this part. And taking into account that both of those parts correspond to energies, that the way how we define the harmonic oscillator, both these energy contributions are always positive. We have here a squared value of velocity in principle. We have a squared value of displacement, both the uh, spring constant and the mass must be positive. So all of those contributions are positive. We can now write that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian the energy is actually a square root of the squared value of the expectation value, which is then a larger and this expression. This comes from the fact that if you derive, if you assign this first part as a kinetic, uh, sorry, potential energy, the second part as the kinetic energy, and you write what is h squared, you write it as actually t plus v squared, because uh, the mean value, uh, so, sorry, now, now you write this squared. So this is T plus U times T plus U or V, v squared. Um, and now you know that a uh, mean value of sum of two variables is a sum of mean values of those variables continue with the expansion where do I continue find the space maybe here so this would be t plus v times t plus u which will be kinetic energy squared plus potential energy squared plus two times kinetic energy, potential energy. These two terms are energies. They are squared, so they are both positive. That means this Hamiltonian, so this is actually a mean value of Hamiltonian squared. This is larger than two times mean value of kinetic energy times the mean value of the potential energy. And in those two terms, you can already got, or you can get this product from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that you know that this part is actually, um, or can be multiplied also by uh, square root of two over four K over M. That means that now uh, we can continue with this inequality and we say that the Hamiltonian is larger than uh, this part, which from the, uh, from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle now becomes two times. And then we have here exactly um, what, uh, what we have here. So, you can make this uh, derivation probably yourself or 
uh, we say uh, that this is now um, h bar squared over four that we have here. And we would need to uh, derive, uh, we would need to multiply the h bar by k over m. And I think there we are. Um, where k over m from the definition of the harmonic oscillator, we know that this is actually the omega squared. So that's the frequency of our harmonic oscillator. And so we end up by saying my massive blackboard, whiteboard, this whole thing is larger. I continue from here, from here, I continue here, is larger than uh, square, uh, than, than two times h bar squared, omega squared over two, which is certainly larger than h bar squared, omega squared over four, it should be four, here, right? And now you look at the beginning, this mess, which was uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, so the mean value of the energy squared is larger than h bar squared omega squared over four. So when we now calculate simply the square roots of everything, we end up with the desired inequality that the Hamiltonian, so the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, or in order the energy of the system of this uh, quantum mechanical oscillator is larger than h bar omega half. It cannot be lower than this value. We actually, from our derivation, we even derived that the h, uh, the, the Hamiltonian must be larger than slightly larger value than this, this, fact, uh, the, this uh, number. Uh, in order to really come to the point that the minimum energy that the Hamiltonian has in its really, really ground state, we would need to perform the full solution of this quantum mechanical oscillator in order to yield uh, the result that the ground state energy is h, uh, h bar omega half. So, uh, hopefully, I have provided you with at least a certain insight into where does this zero point energy come from, that it is related to the quantum nature of the oscillations, because we treat them uh, using the uh, quasi particles, uh, quantum mechanical quasi particles, phonons. We apply to them the Bose Einstein statistic, we do not apply to them the uh, Maxwell Boltzmann statistics, and therefore the total energy of the system in its ground state is not zero, but it's non zero, having the value called zero point energy. This is to explain the value of the, of the total energy. It does not have any significant consequence of what we are going to do further for the heat capacity. So similarly to the electrons, when we try to estimate total energy of a system of electrons that were described by a certain distribution function, and namely the Dirac Fermi statistics, we now transfer the sum over all possible states, that means over all uh, occupied states. Uh, we now multiply the energy of an oscillator times the number of how many of these oscillators we have excited. And we now need to sum over all occupied states. And this sum can be transferred conveniently to all, uh, to, to an integral. Because uh, if you remember, when we spoke about the phonons, the number of k vectors available 
indices for indexing of these uh, uh, of these frequencies. This was uh, proportional to the number of unit cells in our system in our crystal. Now we say we speak about macroscopic crystals, about crystals with large number of unit cells, and therefore the spacing of the K vectors, available K vectors in the reciprocal space is um, infinitesimally small. And we therefore speak about so-called quasi-continuum of states. Between any two states, you find infinitely many other states. Between any two K vectors, you find infinite many K vectors describing um, available states. And this allows you to transfer sum over such states, such variable, to an integral. This is exactly what we do here. And in addition, again, in complete analogy to the electronic system, we now come from the integral over the reciprocal space. We come to the integral over well, either over all energies or over all frequencies. This is now the difference to the energy, uh, to the electronic system, where we had the total energy estimated as a number, uh, as an integral over all possible, uh, all, over all energies. In fact, we can do that the same thing here as well, because we know that the relationship between energy and uh, the frequency is very straightforward. This is just a, a constant multiplication. So it does not really matter whether we speak about energies or the frequencies of the phonons. And exactly in analogy to the electronic system, we now obtain the total energy of the system is an integral over all frequency so we use here the frequency as the quantity which describes all available states and then we multiply the energy times the number of states that are available at a given temperature times the number of states which can be potentially occupied which are available at all for a given frequency Right. So imagine it this way, that for each frequency, you have a certain number of states that can be occupied. This is given by the density of states. And depending on the temperature and the frequency, only a certain fraction of those states which are available will be occupied. This is given by the Jose Einstein statistics. And only this combination of how many I have available times how many I have occupied gives me the total contribution of those which are really occupied, how many states I have, which indeed then contribute to the total energy of the system. If you look at this expression, the Bose-Einstein statistics is known. It might be analytically difficult formula, but it is given here. We know the formula. The energy, well, this is trivial. It's just h bar omega. But the key ingredient which is missing now, which we do not know, is this density of states. And this is something that we need to uh, that we need to obtain, that we need to calculate. Suppose that we know the density of states, we can calculate the heat capacity from the definition. Right? Here you have now the formula for how to calculate the heat capacity of such a system uh, of vibrating atoms, where all the terms but the density of states are known. I also point here, uh, point out here one more index, which is left here, the index P, which uh, 
indexes all available polarizations or vibrational modes. When we had one atom in the unit cell and we spoke about three-dimensional problem, we said that uh, the corresponding number of branches, independent branches, is three. And so then in such a case, for example, for aluminum, the index P would be running over those branches from one to three. Right? If we have two atoms in the unit cell, such as in case of sodium chloride, we have six um, branches in the dispersion relationship, and therefore the index P would be running over those six branches, three acoustic and three optic branches. So what we will be trying to do in the rest of today's lecture is to um, apply certain models, certain approximations to establish, to find the density of states as a function of frequency. And the first account for this was uh, Einstein's model, which dates back to the beginning of 20th century to 1907 in which Einstein assumed n independent oscillators and all of them having the same frequency omega zero. So let us see what is the total energy of such system. Well, it's trivial, right? We have independent oscillators. So each of those oscillators uh, contributes to the total energy with the same contribution given by the Bose-Einstein statistics, we have n such oscillators. So the total energy is simply uh, n times the value corresponding to this oscillator. The temperature dependence, once again, comes through the thermodynamic beta, where the beta is one over k. You can use this to estimate the heat capacity, you arrive at a formula like this, and you get a nicely temperature dependent quantity. The temperature dependence is not only in the prefactor here, but once again is both in the denominator as well as in the nominator. We also define so-called Einstein's temperature, which is a temperature corresponding to the oscillator to, to the oscillator with frequency omega zero. So essentially, uh, it is the temperature at uh, uh, which which corresponds uh, to the energy of the oscillator with energy uh, with frequency omega zero. This is relatively simple, and we might say naive model. It actually works relatively fine for uh, finite temperatures for large temperatures. We'll see that in a, a second. And the reason is that it describes relatively well the optic, or the contribution of optic modes. If you once again remember what was the shape of these uh, phonon dispersion curves, it looked something like this. Right? means that at high temperatures, we have all those modes already, uh, already excited, and we are just exciting more and more of the states only from the optic modes. But those optic modes, the branches, they have very flat dispersion relationships. And this flatness, the fact that they are flat, is very well approximated by the constant value of omega. So we say that the spread of the frequencies corresponding to one branch is negligibly small. That is the reason why the Einstein model works fairly well at high temperatures, but it fails at low temperatures. We'll see that again in a second. 
to account for this failure at zero Kelvin or at low temperatures, Peter Debye proposed a different treatment. Instead of taking the frequency as constant, he proposed the frequency to be proportional to the k vector and to, cons uh, to assume, uh, he assumed a constant sound velocity v. Uh, this is another somehow crude approximation because once again, if you look or if you remember the dispersion relationship where we had the dispersion relations looking like this, then it is fine to say that maybe here at low temperatures, the frequency is indeed linearly proportional to the K, we can do that. But at high temperatures, we have many branches which do not fulfill this, uh, this uh, assumption. So we assume or we expect the Debye model to be reasonable, especially at low temperatures. Debye accounted for the number of states. He also accounted for the uh, explicitly only for the acoustic polarizations because this is what uh, counts for the uh, for the uh, heat capacity, the total energy of the system at low temperature. We account for the density of states again the same way as we did previously uh, from the uh, from the density of points in the reciprocal space and accounting also with this special dispersion relationship. So if you look at the previous slide in which we said, second previous slide in which we said the density of states is given by this formula. Now, assuming that omega equals V times K, K squared equals uh, one over V squared omega squared. So this is what would enter this part and DK over D omega is of course one over V. So eventually from combination of those two terms, we get in the denominator, the factor sound velocity cubed, and in the denominator, we get the uh, frequency squared. So when we come back to the Debye model, the Dutch physicist Peter Debye, um, then indeed these are the terms that we see here. All right, so no uh, brutal magic. The factor three here comes once again from the three dimensional problem and that we account for the three acoustic branches. We now try to estimate how many of those oscillators, how many of those states we have available at all. And since we know how many unit cells we have in our whole system, uh, we know how many states we have, it is the same way how we count the number of states up to the Fermi level. So this is what we do here. We have a density of the states in the reciprocal space times the uh, uh, times the volume of a sphere must give us the total number of states. In here, it is the uh, number of unit cells uh, and by putting now this together, we say that the uh, when, when we occupy all those states, this is corresponding to the highest frequency, so the highest occupied uh, k vector, which would be equivalent of the Fermi k vector. Here it's the Debye k vector, defines not the Fermi energy, but here we say defines the Debye frequency from here. So the d by frequency by combining those, uh, uh, those expressions provides in fact the frequency, uh, the cutoff frequency of the highest occupied state.
or the highest occupied oscillator, right? Because otherwise our linear dispersion relationship would go to infinity to infinite many frequencies. And the reason for this is again to fulfill eventually the Dulong Petit law, the Dulong Petit limit that at high temperatures or let's say fine temperatures, the heat capacity of solids becomes temperature independent. When this is now entered, we eventually put everything into the formula that we had there two slides back. I'm not going to go there again. You can go through this treatment yourself, try to estimate it. It is from there on the only analytics, mathematical analysis, because we now have there the exponential functions that we need to integrate. Um, we know from the DBI model now how does the um, density of states behave in this uh, in this approximation, and uh, when we put all of this together, we figure out that it leads to an integral of a very special form. This is uh, known as a DBI integral. Uh, you can find it in tables. Uh, how this is uh, how this is calculate how this is expressed. Eventually, it allows you to calculate the heat capacity at a given temperature that you are interested in. Right? So the temperature, the heat capacity enters through here. It enters through this upper limit of this variable x, which is the Debye temperature over the temperature. And we have there also one factor, so called Debye temperature, uh, which, is, uh, which is a material constant, let's say, that uh, allows or this describes uh, the, the behavior of the Debye model for the given system. Um, it roughly corresponds to the, by multi, when multiplied by the Boltzmann constant, it uh, corresponds roughly to the energy of the minimum wavelength phonon mode. K, the K vector is two pi over lambda. So, and here we should, oh, this, this is a very unlucky, uh, label that I have here on notation that should be KB and the Debye temperature. Right? So the K vector is two pi over lambda. So when we have now the uh, largest K vector, which corresponds to the Debye temperature, that corresponds to the shortest wavelength that is excited. This has the highest energy. And so when we are increasing the temperature, then the Debye temperature, which corresponds to the energy at which also this highest energy state is excited, that basically corresponds to the situation at which all phonon modes, which are present in our system, are excited. When there is no more contribution to the total energy from lattice vibrations. Right? So you can imagine it that way, that you have a fixed number of oscillators. With increasing temperature, you start, you essentially put energy in all of those, and each of those can carry only a certain fixed value of energy. Right? And as soon as you put in your system enough energy that all of those oscillators are active, they cannot store any more energy. The system vibrates at most. And then the energy, if you increase the energy of the system, or if you still increase the temperature by putting in energy, it needs to be stored elsewhere. It's not anymore stored in the lattice vibrations. And there is another typo here. Sorry for that, of course, it's not exited 
but excited. When we put all of this together, we uh, calculate the d by integral and we calculate the corresponding d by frequency. We found out that the heat capacity is roughly proportional to the temperature to the power of three. So this is now a third, uh, a third result that we are getting for the heat capacity. When we spoke about the heat capacity corresponding to electrons in the Druda model, we said that the heat capacity was constant, equal to the NKB, so to the Dulong Petit limit. When we included the quantum mechanics via the Sommerfeld model, the heat capacity corresponding to electrons increased linearly. So the heat capacity at zero Kelvin was zero, and then it increased. Now we have another sort of storage room for the energy. Right? It's not just the electrons, but it's also the phonons, and we need to excite both of them. And so we are saying that at low temperatures, this heat capacity increases as t to the power of three. So the question is whether the heat capacity of electrons or of lattice vibrations of phonons is more critical, low temperatures and finer temperatures at room temperature. Let's try to have a look at this. Before we do that, we actually compare the Einstein and Debye models. And we see that both of them do a reasonable job at high temperature, eventually converging to the uh, constant value, which would be the Dulong Petit limit. But at, the, at low temperatures, somewhere here, the Einstein model fails, whereas the Debye, or well, fail. We don't know if it fails, but it has a very different behavior than the Debye model, which uh, goes as the t to the power of three. So this is the, uh, the region in which this uh, t to the cube, uh, temperature cube dependence is obtained. Uh, once again, this t cubed dependence was obtained in the limit of temperature going to zero. So this is not the general behavior that the heat capacity in the Debye model at all temperatures follows t to the power of three dependence. No, same as Einstein model, it eventually converges to a constant value to the Dulong Petit limit. So now back to the question, uh, whether the electrons or the phonons are more critical for storing the energy. Now let us now con uh, compare the two contributions. Um, we will not deal with the Trude model. We'll deal with the already quantum mechanical Sommerfeld heat capacity and now the Debye heat capacity. And since we are sort of uh, estimating how does uh, the uh, reminder for you, what was the heat capacity of the electronic system with the linear dependence on the temperature. This is what we got on the previous slide. That in the Debye model, the phonon heat capacity uh, depends on temperature cubed. And now we try to do some estimations. We try to estimate a temperature at which those two heat capacities equal. Essentially, if you think about the linear dependence and t to the power of three dependence, we expect that low temperatures are dominated by the linear dependence 
whereas high temperatures are dominated by the T cubed dependence. So that means the lower temperatures, the electronic contribution is the more important one. Let's say majority of the energy we put in the system is stored in the electronic excitations, whereas at higher temperatures, it will be the lattice vibrations. We estimate this temperature at which these two contributions are equal by simply equal, equating the uh, heat capacities. And by doing that, we arrive at an expression for the T0. Um, when we make some estimates about what are the values for the uh, Fermi temperature, which is corresponding to the uh, Fermi energy, um, and for the Debye temperature. So once again, the Fermi temperature, this is something that we have tabulated here and spoke about uh, two weeks ago during the lecture when we showed that for typical uh, simple metals, the Fermi energy, uh, the, sorry, the Fermi temperature was around 10 to the power of four Kelvin. The Debye temperature at which basically all modes would be excited um, is in the range of hundreds of Kelvin. So when we put all of this together here, we estimate that the uh, value is energy T0 would be in units or maximum dozens of Kelvins. So probably 10 to the zero or 10 to the one Kelvin. This is the order of magnitude, which means that the temperature at which the phonons become the dominant contribution to the heat capacity is few Kelvins, units of Kelvins, dozens of Kelvins, 20, 15 Kelvins, certainly not 100, and certainly not room temperature with 273 Kelvin or 200, actually 98 Kelvin, 273 is the zero uh, degree temperature. So at finite temperatures by which we understand room temperature or even higher temperatures, the electronic excitations, the contribution of electrons to the heat capacity is actually negligible. It is all thermal properties at those temperatures are mostly governed by the phonons, by the lattice vibrations. Well, yet at even higher temperatures, so when we come to uh, some 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 um, or higher fractions of the melting, melting temperature, then additional excitation, structural excitations become important, right? Generation of point defects, uh, the disorder in the system, configurational entropy, and so on. We leave all of this out. We leave those parts for really the thermodynamics. Um, we also do not discuss here any magnetic excitations and magnons, which in a way would be similar to the treatment that we have done here. We would just need to have the distribution or, or their dispersion relation terms. Uh, so, coming back to the topic of this lecture, electrons, atoms, we conclude that electrons are the dominant contribution to the heat capacity at low temperature and phonons dominate at finite temperatures. That brings me to the end of today's somewhat shorter lecture in which we uh, now made a short detour Back to the uh, back to the uh, lattice vibrations, um, we treated those lattice vibrations once again as a set of harmonic oscillators. This is the same thing that what we what we did a couple of weeks ago in the chapter lattice vibrations. What we did now is that we used the information from that uh, section where we derived the dispersion relationships which were the, the description of all available uh, vibrational modes in terms of frequencies um, from which we actually, from this uh, real dispersion relationship, we can obtain the real density of states. 
We now put it together with the uh, Bose-Einstein statistics. So similarly to what we did last week for the electrons, we did this week uh, for phonons, for the boson particles, calculated the total energy and used it to derive the heat capacity. Now we didn't do actually the treatment of the explicit uh, dispersion relationships. This is beyond the scope of this course. And instead we introduced two simple models. The first one was the Einstein model in which all phonon frequencies are considered to be constant equal to omega zero. And we said that this is a reasonable description for high temperatures uh, in which we are exciting the optic modes. And this is the reason why the Einstein model works relatively fine at high temperatures at room and above temperature uh, in which we are pretty much exciting the flat bands corresponding to the optic modes. When we come to the lower temperatures, the Einstein model is no longer good. And we should actually con consider the acoustic modes, which we did via the DBI model in which the frequency was not constant, but was proportional to the K vector with a sound velocity B. Um, it describes reasonably well acoustic modes and by introducing the cutoff uh, frequency by frequency corresponding to the by temperature, we uh, in a way describe or we account also for the contribution of the optic modes indirectly. This treatment, leads us to a heat capacity that at zero Kelvin has a very reasonable T to the cube uh, dependence, which is very well describing the experimental observations at not the ultra low temperatures, but the intermediate low temperatures, at temperatures where the uh, phonons dominate the heat capacity. And this, uh, domination of the heat capacity by phonons we have derived that happens at units uh, or dozens of Kelvins up to the room temperature, up to the fact where other uh, uh, excitations take over. Electronic heat capacity is dominant at ultra low temperatures between zero Kelvin and let's say 10 Kelvin. 